everybody's for it. Go ahead, Chase. Well, I'm, first I can thank you all for coming, and I don't know if anyone has been tracking parking and Sandy, but I found out that we're both arriving in State College at the same time. <laughs> <laughs> so that should be lots of fun. <laughs> um, so I wanted to kind of give you uh, a little bit of background about uh, car systems in general before I jump in exactly to you know the work that I've been doing over about the last year. Now, I thought, you know, first we'll start with kind of uh, these different karst regions you can see them around the world here. And when they describe a karst region or a karst system, there's two things that they're describing. One is that there's a relatively soluble, highly soluble rock. So that's a lot of times is a calcium carbonate rock, just like what we have here in, in Florida, a limestone bedrock. And the second thing is, is that it has a high secondary porosity. And what that means is it's basically like Swiss cheese. You know, when you hold a Swiss cheese, you have these big holes that run through it, that this, the underlying uh, geology has those same kind of conduits that go through it. And because of that, it actually helps to transmit water very quickly. It holds a lot of water. And it actually provides a large drinking source of water to a number of people. Here in Florida, down in the South Florida, it's over 5 million people get their drinking water from our Biscayne Aquifer. Worldwide, that's 15 to 20 percent of the world's population that gets their water from these car systems. So they're really important and they're really used. So I wanted to show you where these car systems were because I thought, especially here, they're mainly located in the northern hemisphere. And where they uh, are located in the northern hemisphere, we can actually take a map of where wetland distributions occur and lay that over this map. And you can kind of start to see that not only in South Florida do we have wetlands that overlay a karst system, but actually you find it in a number of places around the world. So here's that wetlands distribution image. And what I'd really like you to focus on are just really the green areas, because those you can kind of pick out with your eyes a little bit better. So here in South Florida, over in Europe, here in China, Asia. So we can flip back and forth and you can start to see when you look at the pink and you look at the green that there are a number of areas where the two coincide. So the work that's done here in South Florida is actually really important. And us understanding how we manage our system down here can be utilized around the world. In addition, we can understand not only how can we manage our water system, but how can we manage it for the people that are here as well as to protect the wetland system that occurs here as well. So here is South Florida, and um, just to give you an idea of the extent of the Biscayne Aquifer in relative uh, perspective to the Everglades, this area here in the darker gray is the Biscayne Aquifer. Again, it's an extremely uh, conductive aquifer, and it has those nice big conduits, and they're so big that the last speaker, Dr. Stocker, is actually able to fit inside of them. So we're talking, you know, some big, some big conduits that can move quite a bit of water. Now, out in the Everglades, a lot of this uh, limestone bedrock is actually overlain by peat. Now, historically, water would have overflown Lake Okeechobee, come down the center of the state, and either exited through Sharp Slough or through Taylor Slough out into the Gulf of Mexico and into the Bay. But the 20th century brought around the construction of canals, dikes, and levees, which you can see automatically reduced surface water flow here and compartmentalized the Everglades. But what it also did was it changed water level regimes. So up here in this area that they call the Everglades agricultural area, water levels were reduced to allow for agriculture to grow. But along the eastern boundary of the Everglades, urbanization and agriculture were both prominent things and it reduced the water levels along this area as well. Now, out in the center of the uh, Everglades, you know, we still have relatively high water levels, especially at the ends of these water conservation areas. Those are the kind of areas here that are indicated. But along the eastern boundary and up in those ag agricultural areas, what has been lost is that peat unit. Now, peat is uh, a lower, has a lower hydraulic conductivity or a lower ability to pass water through it than the underlying limestone bedrock. And what that does is by having that unit of peat between the surface water and the underlying bedrock, it actually kind of slows the interaction between that surface water and the underlying groundwater in the, in the limestone bedrock. Now up here in the agriculture area, you can see that there's actually been a loss, a subsidence of almost 10 feet of peat. 
But the subsidence and the losses have been seen all across the eastern boundary of the Everglades. And in one area specifically I'm going to talk to you about today, which is in Taylor Sluhead Waters. Now, not only have we seen a loss of this hydrologically resistant peak across the Everglades, but we've also seen a change in the types of groundwater surface water interactions that occur. So here is the pre drainage Everglades. And what you can see is there's not a large difference between this is a surface water level out here, indicated by that penguin triangle, and this little triangle here, those are groundwater levels. So there's not a very big difference in the water levels themselves. But in the more present day system, what is seen is that the water levels are much higher in comparison in the center of the Everglades compared to out on that coastal region area, like where we are right now, where water levels have been drawn down so that we can persist out here. In addition, as you move from the north to the southern portion of the Everglades, again, you have, uh, as you move from the water conservation areas, you have these changes. So it's changing the gradient at which water occurs now. So water wants to flow from the areas of highest elevation to the areas of lowest elevation. So in the pre-drainage Everglades, groundwater surface water interactions weren't quite as uh, large. Now we have them occurring at both a, a, a regional scale, right? So we have a larger increase in the regional scale of these groundwater flow paths that have occurred due to the construction of these canals and levees and the lowering of water on the eastern coast of uh, Florida. But also there's changes in the local groundwater flow paths that occur right in the vicinity of these structures as well. So what can happen is this, if we kind of take a look at this image to get an idea of local groundwater flow paths, you know, if you have higher water levels here, it can actually change that flow path and cause water to flow from the areas of highest elevation to lowest elevation. So in this image, water would flow from this canal out towards either edges. And that's changing the type of local groundwater surface water interactions. So the, in, uh, the question that Harvey asked was, well then how has the construction of canals and dikes and levees altered the water budget of the Everglades? And when you think about a water budget, it's just like balancing your bank account, right? You're going to have some amount of money that comes in, hopefully, every year if you're not a student. And um, you have your surface water inputs, precipitation, and inputs of groundwater. Then you have your losses, and that would be more like, you know, you paying tuition at FIU, and you have evapotranspiration, groundwater out, and surface water out. Now, you can add these up at different time steps. You can look at it annually. You can look at it on a monthly basis. And what you'll see is that, depending on how much inputs you've had and how much loss you've had, it's going to change the balance of your bank account, right? That's what happens. And that's exactly what happens hydrologically. So if you have a lot of inputs, the volume of water, that's the amount of water in storage, will increase. If we have a lot of outputs, the volume of water that's in storage will decrease. So that's your change in storage over here. So Harvey and all asked this question, you know, how, how have canals, uh, dikes, and levees altered it? So here's the pre-drainage Everglades, and they used a natural system model here, and then this is a present-day Everglades. And it's mainly just the northern and central portion of the Everglades here. And what I really want you to pay attention to is this portion here, which says the percent of total input. So, and on both sides of the market. So, first thing that we're going to look at is precipitation and evapotranspiration, because they are actually the largest drivers of the water budget. So here, uh, historically in pre-drainage times, you know, precipitation took about 81% and evapotranspiration 74. Now in present day, we've seen a decrease in the influence of precipitation, so down to 66%, and then we've seen that they've become closer. So the losses through evapotranspiration have come much closer to the inputs of precipitation. In addition, what's been seen is that there's a larger input of canal surface water into the Everglades. Historically, we didn't have canals down here. So. You know, now we have 20% canal our surface water that's coming in. And then the next thing is this one down here, is groundwater recharge. And historically, about 1% to 2% of uh, the water budget consisted of groundwater recharge and discharge. But nowadays, it's almost 17% of two out of the two that uh, make up that water budget. So we've had a really large change in the groundwater surface water interactions with the uh, onset of these of the canals, dikes, and levees. So you may say, why are you telling me all of this? And it's because all of these different water bodies, the changes in the water that goes into the Everglades varies in its, um, uh, its chemical uh, concentrations. 
So this is an image up here of that. These are all sorts of different types of water bodies uh, that are found out in the Everglades from precipitation to surface water to groundwater, all of them having different chemical constituents. Now, the Everglades is typically a lycotrophic. It was fed by precipitation. As the changes in inputs of water to the system have come with uh, current day setting with the canals and the dikes and the levees, so has the changes in the chemistry that influences the vegetation out in the Everglades. In addition to that, the change in the flow patterns also changes the type of chemistry of the groundwater, right? If the groundwaters have less contact time with the underlying sediments, then the chemistry will be slightly different. If the groundwater has longer contact time with the underlying sediments, again, a different chemistry. So not only is the inputs of water that are going into the Everglades from canals and things of that nature altering the chemistry in the Everglades, so could be the changes in the types of groundwater surface water interactions and the groundwater flow passed out to the system. Now this is important for a number of reasons, and specifically because the Everglades is uh, an oligotrophic system, and with increased canal inputs, uh, seen in these two examples here, you can have nutrient loading that are associated with them. So inputs of phosphorus, specifically. And with those inputs of phosphorus, near these direct canal inputs, they've seen an increase in uh, cattail vegetation, so instead of sawgrass, monoculture cattail. It doesn't support as diverse of a community. So it's degrading our, the ecosystem itself. And then also they've seen uh, alterations in the paraphyton communities too. So here you typically can find these calcareous paraphyton mats um, in portions of the Everglades. And they're typically found in you know, low uh, nutrient areas. But what is seen is that as you have an increase in nutrient loading, these systems move more towards these filamentous algae, and then in areas where you've had a high nutrient loading, a lot of times you don't even find terrifying. So the changes that are occurring in these types of flow patterns and the inputs of water into the system really have an important role in the types of ecological processes, the types of patterns that we see out in the Everglades. Now one area where there has been uh, a lot of restoration that's been going on is in Taylor Slough. And at the headwaters of Taylor Slough, since uh, over the, like the early 80s, they've been going with a more of a direct canal uh, water input to rehydrate Taylor Slough. So here's Taylor Slough. It's located in this nice blue color. Right here. And this is the Taylor Slough headwaters. And that's the area that I'm going to focus on for my talk. Now, there's been a construction of, of many canals in this area. You can see them all here in these blue lines. And I wanted to show you a little bit of data right now on how the construction of these canals has really influenced the water levels right here at the kind of, I would call it the gate to Taylor Slough, right? So this is the headwaters. Water passes through here and then rehydrates uh, a, lot of, a large portion of Taylor Slough itself. <coughs> So this is uh, weeks of the year down here. This is a uh, work done by Van Lent and Johnson. And this is water level in feet. And what you see is this dark line right here. That is the average water level at that Taylor Slough bridge point from 1933 to 1947. This is the ground elevation here. Then we have the average water level from 1965 to 1989, and that's indicated in this little dotted line here. And what you see is that with, along with the construction of the canals along the side of this um, Taylor Slough headwaters, there's been a reduction of about a foot and a half of water levels uh, during the height of the wet season. And that the onset of the system drying out is now about a month and a half earlier. So the system has become drier and it, it holds a lot less water, or the water levels aren't quite as high. So here's Taylor Slough, and I, I thought it'd be nice to show you guys a 1944 image. Pete Harlan gave me some of these pictures here. Um, and you can see this is the headwaters of Taylor Slough are here, and there used to be kind of like a, a depression that kind of curved. Can you guys see that? Mm -hmm. Curved all the way up um, the headwaters of Taylor Slough. Now, if you look at this 2004 image, you can still kind of see that depression. It kind of goes up into here, but it's bisected now by this L31 canal. It would have gone up back through here, 
again, crossing that L31 canal again, and then it should have gone back up kind of in that area. So there were a number of canals that drained the headwaters of uh, Taylor Slough in the early 50s and then into the 60s. But the largest one that had the, the largest effect was the L31 canal, which completely uh, bisected that little drainage area that brought water down to the main portion of Taylor Slough below. Now, they did construct that L31 canal to actually bring more water to Taylor Slough, but unfortunately, it just didn't work the way that they thought it was going to. So, oh, it says I have to come with you by the top. With your leg. So, in 1983, uh, the S332 pump station was, was built. And the idea of this pump station was to pump water from this L31 canal directly into the tail headwaters of Taylor Slough to try to rehydrate the southern portion of the slough area, the main slough. Now I'm going to call that direct restoration, so directly pumping water from the L31 canal into the area. Now this had no effect on anything north of that L30 of that S332 pump station. It doesn't affect water levels up there at all. So it's still leaving the rocky or the rocky glades or the headwaters of Taylor Slough completely dry. So in 1999-2000, there was the construction of um, several retention basins. So there's four of them here. They're called the S332B, BN, C, D. You can see them here in these nice light colors. And, and so instead of going from this direct restoration effort of literally pumping surface canal water into the, um, into the wetland itself, what they did was they pumped canal water into the retention basin in order to create what they call as a hydrologic bridge. So the water levels here in the center of this retention basin are higher than they are in the canal, and they're supposed to be higher than they are on Taylor Slough. And so the idea was to create this ridge so water wouldn't flow from Taylor Slough headwaters out to the canal, and uh, it will keep water within the Taylor Slough headwaters. And now this I'm going to call diffuse restoration. All right, so we're not, uh, most of these basins are predominantly closed water systems, right? So that surface water really is just infiltrating into the ground in these systems here. So my objective today is to determine the influence of uh, this diffuse hydrologic restoration on groundwater surface water interactions in the Taylor Slough headwaters. And I'm going to take a similar approach to what I explained to you before, which is using a water budget. I've gone over most of the parameters here in the water budget, and what we're going to be doing is determining all of these values to solve for R, or groundwater surface water interactions. Now I use 19 wells, uh, 49 surface water stages, uh, 12 precipitation sta uh, stations, four pump stations, three flow sites, and two other stations, and more, more and more data. And from 1997 to 2011. So I did this on a, on a daily time step. I got all of this data, and you can see them. Where? Out of battery here. You can see them though here in this image. So the black is the outline of the Taylor Slough headwaters, as you can see. The important thing here I think we haven't talked about is that groundwater seepage out of the eastern boundary and then seepage along the south boundary. So that I calculated groundwater seepage here along the C111 canal and then the L31 north canal up towards the north from this basin out this way, as well as seepage out of the south portion of the headwaters down across the English Trap. Again, you can see these four basins that were here, um, and those were put into place around 2000. Now, before I can jump right into the data, I have to say, you know, you do have to take climate into consideration. And in order for me to take climate into consideration, I had to do a couple of things uh, to, to try and understand how climate uh, also was influencing the type of interactions that we were seeing out there. And so this is, I just wanted to show these graphs, you know, here are a number of different um, climatic indices. You can see that they're quite variable, they influence precipitation. And here, that's shown quite clearly in this guidebook paper, this is cumulative deviation of annual rainfall. And you can see, depending on where you are in the Atlantic multidecadal oscillation, that variability changes. So just to give you that idea. Now I used a man candle trend analysis to kind of get an idea of how um, you know, precipitation was changing over that 15-year time period that I was studying, so from 1997 through 2011. 
So I think it's important to start uh, first with the biggest drivers of the water budget. I think that they're, they're the most important. Um, so what we saw was that over that 15 year time period, there was a significant decrease in the amount of precipitation that was going into Taylor Slough. And that's indicated here in these blue uh, diamonds. Now this is the annual amount of evapotranspiration that also uh, was calculated for the basin. You're going to notice all of, all of the values that I'm going to show you for the next several slides are all in, in a depth. So they're all normalized to the area of the entire basin itself, which is about 191 uh, square kilometers. So what you see is not only do we have declining precipitation occurring during this period, but we start to see an increase in evapotranspiration. And especially between 2004 and 2008, precipitation and evapotranspiration are really close to being equal in the system. So we have, you know, right now our our water budget are, you know, it's almost zero. Our, our bank account's at zero almost right now. So any kind of restoration efforts will likely have a really large effect when you already have a balance of zero to start with. Now this is uh, trends in the water levels across this area. This is not water levels themselves, they're the trends. They indicate, the red indicated negative trends, so a decrease in water levels in the basin. The blue indicate uh, an increase in water levels over this time period, so over that 15 year time period. So we first take a look at the annual, um, uh, at an annual scale of water levels here. And what you can see, which is what you would expect along the western boundary of the, uh, of the uh, Taylor Slough headwaters here, is that there was a significant decline in surface water levels. And I would expect that there was a significant decline in precipitation, more evap evapotranspiration. But what's interesting is near these basins, you can see this is a nice light blue color in here, right around those retention basins. And you see that water levels actually have kind of a positive trend here now on the annual basis. Now during the dry season, everything was, you know, for the most part, um, there was a decline in water levels. And then when we look specifically at, at during the wet season, what we see is there's a really large increase uh, adjacent to these retention basins. We see this really, uh, this blue color here. So the water levels are having a positive trend in that area. While out here during the wet season, within the basin itself and on the western edge, you see that the water levels are either staying the same or slightly decreased. So this information, these trends in the water levels are saying, well, half of the basin is responding to the climate, but the other half of the basin isn't, right? And it's suggesting to us that these retention basins really are influencing significantly the water levels in the hydrology along that eastern boundary. But to really understand what's going on, we need to look at all of the water budget parameters. All right, so up here we have, I know there's a lot of graphs, try to get through them quickly though. Here, these are annual values on, in these bar graphs. Here, these are monthly values. So the average monthly value for the three different time periods. So I have, when we had direct hydrologic restoration, so that's the inputs of uh, surface water directly through that S332 pump station, are in blue. From 2000 and on is when we had that more diffuse um, hydrologic restoration in night even changed it from 2003 on because all of the basins at that point were actually functioning in some capacity from that point on. Um, the top two images that you see are surface water inputs. And so those are the inputs that are managed by uh, South Florida Water Management District. And so that's the actual restoration effort, you can kind of say, in, in some respects. And what you see over this time period is that you know, they really did increase the amount of surface water for the most part that they were putting into those basins. And they increased it, especially during the wet season, from July until December. Then you can say, okay, well, what kind of influence did that have on groundwater seepage? You see that there's a large increase in the amount of groundwater seepage that occurred out that eastern boundary. So a lot of water that they're putting in, as they expected, is going right back into that now. So that is occurring. And also that's occurring right here between July and December. And then the next question is, all right, so then what about the water that's leaving the headwaters of Taylor Slough and then making its way down to the main slough itself under that Taylor Slough bridge? Well, that is declining for the most part. The average is a decline. So inevitably, the water that 
it's being used for the, that's being pumped into these basins where we do see that they're influencing water levels, you know, increasing groundwater seepage, but for the most part, it's really not making its way down to uh, Taylor School Bridge. And that could be because, you know, we had a significant decline in precipitation, so half that basin, even if those, you know, uh, retention basins are doing the best that they can do, if you cut the water, diminish half the basin and the amount of precipitation that's coming in, you know, you really, there's still going to be a decrease in the amount of surface water that flows out of that. And this kind of suggests that as well. Every time you see large inputs during this time period, during that diffuse restoration period, large inputs of surface water from the managers, you see large outputs of uh, surface water from the Taylor Slough headwaters to the main basin. Can you just tell me about what's the, the, uh, the y axis on the, on the bottom figure there? And this, you, these are no, years. This, axis, but like, well, this is months. Yeah, y, I don't know. Oh, on the y axis? Yeah. So, oh, these are all the same thing. So this is surface water inputs in centimeters. This is just at a monthly basis. Right, but it's negative. So yeah, are, so these are all negative, right? They're losses from the system. Uh, okay. That's why they're negative. Okay. Yeah, sorry, I should have I uh, let you know that. They're negative uh, because they're losses, they're positive because they're inputs. So if there was standing surface water, would that be, that still could be mined? Yeah, yeah. Okay. All right. it's, just it's just a loss, yeah. yeah. Okay. Just ma map that note, yeah. Like, All right, so we know that there's a, uh, that there's a change in the, in the water levels. We've seen that on the western boundary, you know, we've seen a decline in water levels, a slight increase along the eastern boundary of the Taylor Slough so headwaters. We've seen, you know, there's an increase in groundwater seepage, but we're not getting as much water out of, you know, down transported to the actual main portion of the slough under that Taylor Slough bridge. And so you see, well, what about the change in storage? How is that differing? You know, and what I found was it actually kind of remained the same. You know, the change in storage didn't really vary from over that 15 year time period, which kind of surprised me. But what did vary with the onset of that diffuse um, hydrologic restoration effort was that the interannual variability increased dramatically. So now the system was wetter during the wet season and drier during the dry season. So we're actually going to both extremes at this period of time from especially about, you know, you can start to see it in increase it quite linearly from 2000 on. So now we have a more variable system. So what does that mean for our groundwater, surface water interactions? So here again, these are annual values on the top. Positive values here indicate that groundwater discharged to the surface, right? So it's an input to that surface. Negative values here indicate that surface water recharged the ground. <coughs> we see that during that uh, direct period, 1997 through 2000 or 1997 to 1999, that the predominant direction of, of water was that the surface water recharged the groundwater. And my data said that. Renee has done studies out there during that same time period that has come to that same conclusion and same with Harvey and all. Now, from 2000, or, yeah, from 2000 and on, for the most part, what you see is that we do have positive values. We have groundwater that's discharging to the surface. So we've changed the system quite dramatically here. And we, it's actually quite a bit of water now, 60 centimeters, we're not doing quite a bit of water. And that when that has changed is kind of a slightly different. So really from, this is September through January. So the surface water inputs are highest from July through December, and groundwater discharge is really highest from, uh, and, and altered from that direct input to the diffuse input in the green, is really altered from uh, September through January. So there's a little bit of a lag um, in groundwater actually discharging out towards that uh, groundwater discharge into the surface. So I want to bring it back to this image here where we were looking at before. So we had, you know, I think I've pounded this into your head, you know, loss of precipitation. We had a, a decline in water levels that occurred on that western boundary in the northern portion of Taylor Slough headwaters. But here, along the eastern boundary, you know, we saw that water levels basically remained the same. They were positive, slight increase in, in water levels along that period, along that axis, I guess. So what our data is suggesting is that those higher water levels are likely supported by that groundwater discharge that we're seeing. So it's suggesting that 
groundwater discharge is likely occurring in the vicinity of these basins. You can kind of see the influence, the zone of influence that these basins have, especially on the annual level, and then especially again during the wet season. You know, so it's, you know, we said we saw groundwater discharge starting to happen in September, so about September, October, November is when you're going to see a lot of the red groundwater discharge occurring in this area. Now, what does that mean for the, the ecology of that system, right? So it suggests that, you know, this ecosystem may be moving towards a slightly wetter community out here near those basins. It also suggests that it may be a slightly more nutrient-rich area. And the reason I'm going to say that is because there have been studies done out there that have looked at the groundwater chemistry and looked at the canal water chemistry, and the nutrient concentrations in the canals and the nutrient concentrations in the groundwater are basically exactly the same. So instead of having direct inputs of canal water down here, which was influencing you know, the, uh, the ecology of the system down in this small portion, now it's spread out over a wider area. Not, so it's not nutrient, it's not as um, concentrated, but over a larger area, you are likely influencing the nutrient concentrations along the boundary of uh, Everglades National Park, of that Taylor Sea water. So with that, um, I'd like to conclude and say that, you know, that the diffuse restoration efforts um, they led to, they were concurrent with groundwater discharge. They influenced a larger spatial area compared to the direct restoration efforts. And that they resulted in a more variable hydrologic conditions in Taylor Slough headwaters compared to the diffuse uh, restoration efforts. And with that, I'll acknowledge um, the support from a, a number of different agencies and thank you for your time. Okay, so we have plenty of time for questions. Anybody have any questions? Yeah. Okay, so the park and parts are very concerned about the pet hills coming in along the river soon yeah. below the puppy estate. Mm -hmm. And is what you're saying then that that's likely a legacy of the original pumping and that they might see those either stop? continuing to increase, or is the whole basin going to turn to cat? I think that, well, I think that there's a huge legacy there. That's been going on for, you know, since 83. They've been pumping water in there. And every time, especially that system dries out, which has dried out a lot recently in the last 10 years, you're going to have some desiccation of, material, of, of soils, right? And you have a more liberation of that phosphorus, which is probably what's driving a lot of that cattail expansion down there at this point in time. I think that for the nutrient loading, if, if you know, if everything is, you know, for all the nutrient loading that could be happening in here, it's over a much larger spatial area. So it's about the same volume of water that's making it out there as you're making it out using the, you know, specifically this direct um, uh, method. But it's over a much larger area, so I think it would take a, a lot longer time period before you would see cattails explode across, uh, you know, Taylor Slough headwaters. Why or how the groundwater discharge would be happening on the eastern boundary? So these detention ponds, are they impermeable? Are they lined with something? Or no, they're not. They they're basically just, the water which is they're just pump ponds. water into the retention basins. The retention basins are basically open karst limestone. Right. So there, is it possible that the water in the retention basins kind of like percolates down and pushes the groundwater, which then expresses itself? Yes, so up to the other side. That's kind of yeah. That's exactly the idea. So it's it's a matter of, of creating a hydrologic head, right? Right. And and given a high enough head, it can overcome. Let's see here, right? Given a high enough head, it can overcome this, and you have some water that moves out here, right? And so the question was whether or not that's actually leading to is it, is it actually coming back, you know, up? And the the, the data says it is that there is groundwater discharge occurring here in those basins. And this will be happening more in the rest season. It seems to be happening mostly in the wet season, yes. Yes. Hey, Pam, um, Pam, so the high variability between wet and dry season, mm -hmm. post restoration, is that a spatial or a spatial effect because the areas against the retention are getting wetter and everything else getting drier? Is that a spatial um, effect or? This one. Oh, sorry. 
Okay. So you needed the spatial graphs that it showed, right? No, the fact that you're getting higher deviation between the wet and the drier, right? Yeah. Is that a space? Is that because of the space? Things are getting wetter in some parts and space. Yes, and getting and getting drier exactly. Okay. And that you're well, also there. There's this, the water levels are coming up, 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 but they're coming crashing back down too during the dry season, right? So. There are still some, you know, water levels that are slightly lower during that dry season. So they're being elevated even more, and then they're coming crashing back down during the dry season. And so it's creating a larger variability in um, the actual water levels themselves. Uh, in the uh, dry season, mm -hmm. it's adjacent to the Marl Prairies there, and they have uh, prescription burns and so forth. And I'm sure burns have gone through and into and burned a lot of that. Uh, mucky material that yeah. tends to seal the Everglades. And so um, my question is, um, can we ever really quote, seal and uh, cause surface water to flow in a leaky basin? Do you, you mean restore the peat that may have been yeah, there before? You really can't get the water down here. It's going to soak into the ground before it goes very far. Well, I think one thing too is uh, is that this is, I think we, I want to make sure that we understand that this is a, during a dry climatic period that we're talking about too, right? During wetter periods, I think that you would see a lot more water that would be moving down into the Taylor, into the main portion of Taylor Slough. But unless water levels are, are elevated in general, I don't think that you're going to form that, that peat material that you need. So, you know, it's, an, it's a matter of elevating water levels enough, and I don't know if that's actually, you know, that, that is a very big struggle, I would say. So I think you know, one of the things about these, these canals and these, these detention ideas is that they're going to mound water mm -hmm. and isolate Eastern Taylor Slough from the influences of urbanized agricultural canal mm -hmm. to the east. Yeah. Right? And so what you're showing here, I think, that says at least during the wet season, they're doing that. Right? Mm -hmm. You get this high level of water. Yes. Um, in, in areas, right? You know, I think it's know, still kind of patchy. Edge. Yeah. Yeah, right. Patchy along that edge. Um, so I guess this says that that's kind of working, right? Yeah. Just doing that. Mm -hmm. Okay. And the other thing, maybe during the dry season, you can the same thing. Is you, you know, how does this fit to filling in a overall lower groundwater, like across the eastern, from that side mm -hmm. of the east? How does like, like, in other words, do you have to fill all that space before you really bring the water levels up and uh, all the peats and well, the surface water? I mean, I would be. I don't think we could even come close to creating that kind of gradient to push that much water back this way because inevitably water levels are always going to be lower on this on the urban side. And that's exactly what our data said was that the water we had a huge amount of seepage. A lot of the water that they put into those basins went right back out into the canal. It was only a small part that actually went back out into the uh, into the into the Taylor's and headwaters themselves. Right, so I don't think we're going to get the it. Excess <laughs> water to rehydrate that northwestern boundary. The water's going to come from the northwest. But, yeah, yeah, that's the only way it's going to. And that's going to go to the east too. Yes. Which basically what um, you're saying that in wet season we can see the result of restoration, but not necessarily on the dry right season. Yeah, you could put it. I think you could say so, it similarly. I mean, there is some there is some influence, I think, but I, I would say that yes, that it's more during the wet season. It's it's a temporal thing. There's only a se several months during the year where you really have a large influence from those those basins. So, but that's also because that's how they manage. You know. Yes, but basically, dry, dry season, which is almost six months a year, that resolution is not working. Um, I wouldn't say that. No, I would say that I would. Uh, I would say like the the height of the dry season is really where it, you know February, March, and April is probably when you definitely those, they're not functioning. But I wouldn't say other times necessarily that it's six months of the year. I wouldn't put it that way. And it's not functioning because there's no inputs. Yeah, they don't. They're yeah, the inputs are very low, if at all. I mean, historically, right, this area. I mean, would have been cut off. I mean, that's a localized high. Yes. Right? So it wouldn't have been receiving any kind of inputs, regardless. Well, of it, precipitation. It would have been driven by precipitation and what would have come across the the actual western boundary during high water level times. This the north and western boundary. No, but canal. By March us, and April, it would have been. Cut off. 
Yeah, Mars. Yeah, it would have. It, it historically would have been dry during the high, the the driest periods of the year, which is you know, yeah, March and April. And that's what the first image showed you too, right? In the in the thirties. Yeah. Um, so when you had the um, Harvey and McCormick um, water budget, mm -hmm. sixteen percent of that water is being lost with groundwater, mm -hmm. and it's you said it. It's because of contact with, with the sediment. So is the lack of the peat the main driver of no, the it's No, dri it's driven by a lot of things, okay. right? So there's uh, several different things. One is that, yes, we have increased the ability for surface water to, co to have contact with the underlying limestone. Mm -hmm. But what it's really driven by is this huge gradient that we've created, right. right? So if the center of the Everglades, we allow rainfall to pile up there, but on the urban uh, boundary, we draw it down as far as we can, there's a gradient in that gradient has to be dealt with, so water will flow this way, right. you know, and surface water will recharge the groundwater that's flowing out of the system. Right, right. I was just wondering, because I was, you know, I read um, like McCoy's description of this area, and he talks about pee, yeah. you know, and sort of all that stuff being burned off, so much different. It was a much different much system. Much different um, system altogether. Yeah, and I do think that that does probably play a role in, in the ability to transmit surface water down to the main portion of Taylor Slough. You know, without that hydro, like that hydrologically resistant heat material, I think you know it does have it does play a role. Uh, but gradient is the biggest factor. Can you go to your uh, balance sheet real quick? Yeah. Uh, I don't know. I think we had a percentage. <laughs> oh, I mean, um, one of the big differences I think on that is that um, when you're about thirty percent low on water, you're seven. No. Pre drainage 742 total cubic, you know, 742 to 4.6. All the percentages change, it's still a drop of about 40% of the water. Yeah, yeah. The total water in the system is 40% less now. Right. So, um, evapotranspiration is increasing for a long time. In the last four years or so, it's decreased. Um, so why do you think? Well, I think a lot of that has to do with the dryness of the system. The way that the model was built was that it um, that if there was standing surface water out there, it was free to evaporate like at, at its highest rate. But if the water table dropped below the ground surface, that evaporation went accordingly, right? You can't. There's not a free surface water body. Evaporation is going to decline as that water table drops below the ground, right? And so that was built into the model, and along that uh, western boundary, you know, that's where we started to see a lot of decline in surface water, and it was drying out a lot for longer periods of the year. And I think that's what was influencing a lot of that decline in evapotranspiration. One last question. So, so basically, you can see the essential difference between canal flow inputs and uh, filling these extension ponds is that. These retention basins act like capacitors. They just like capacitors in the landscape, mm -hmm. they just store water for a longer time and uh, they just diffuse the water inputs. I think, that, yes, they just use they the water input. Water. Yeah, they make they, they spread it over a larger area. So I think that's really the, the difference between them at this point. And if they could provide more surface water inputs in the dry season or at least in maybe early dry season, they could have you know, more of a hydration effect, at least in the eastern Taylor Yeah. Were you surprised that the hydration effect is so localized? Um, I was surprised that there was groundwater discharge. <laughs> <laughs> to tell you so the truth, I mean, Renee and I have gone out to those basins, and and they're usually dry. Yeah. So the fact that you know, it was really surprising that this is. And what what is like. kind of, I don't know if those detention basins are acting as capacitors. I think it's it's the amount of pumping you can do. Uh, it's not that the basins are holding water for such a long time. Yeah, just, they don't. The pumps are running. Yeah. Because it really is, this area is like Swiss cheese. You put yeah. water, you know, I've seen them operate those pumps. Like at maximum, why the water doesn't go to 100 meters and it's going. Yeah. You know, it's like, you know, most of the time. Yeah. Are those basins, is the vegetation different? Or you guys look at the vegetation. Yeah, I mean, they were scraped, so they, they were scraped. They were scraped, so most everything, the sediments in there were brought into it. So is it changing the nutrients? Is it like working as a bumper at all to, or? It, well, I don't think it really even necessarily influences it because 
I, the groundwater chemistry is the same as, as that canal water. So I don't think it's really having that large of an effect. I mean, maybe it's, it's catching some of those nutrients, but I don't think it's we really that they were, This is not, this is a couple, you know, several years ago, this morning, that we thought that these things would be like, it's you know, ex post facto STAs, right? That when you're building soil, you wanted to see, okay, how much of the sinfluent water was creating soil. And then after like two, three years, you weren't getting soil. We still had bare spots of rock where they had scraped off. We had soil only in the kind of the residual areas where there was soil below the grade kind of thing. Um, they really weren't accreting like an STA because they're so porous. We thought we'd go out there in the dry and in the wet and see the different, and you know, hide in the wet. There's not a lot of standing water. They weren't really acting as, you know, they, they were, well, there's a lot of retention basins built as like STAs that don't have enough water to fill. You can work like with Jones, there's dry drain or dry, dry filters. It's kind of like a bruise. Are we all right? Yeah, one, 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 this, one, this is the last <laughs> question, I guess. Yes. Um, <laughs> it seems that such a slew is more like a transverse glade. But because the transverse glades kicked in, it would overflow when the Everglades actually was full and it would flow across. And it would seem, being next to the ridge there, that when the water got to a certain point, it would also start flowing. That perhaps it was just a seasonal event. I, a seasonal event that water would flow more, to, more yeah. down into here? Like a transverse glade. I don't deeper. think it was as much like the transverse glades this way. I don't think it was that dramatic. I mean, water would overflow, but a lot of accounts of it are at the very height of the wet season, when water was already in Taylor Slough headwaters, when water was already flowing down. When you read the descriptions of, of it historically, it doesn't sound like it was occasionally wetted, you know, like it was an occasional process. It happened every year, and what was more occasional was the, the water coming from Shark Slough into Taylor Slough. I think that was more, that was a, a phenomenon driven by extreme wet season. Okay, thank you. Thank you, guys. <laughs>